there. I'm a member of the Catapult Speakers Bureau, who they've been so kind as to sponsor uh, my honorarium for today. And I'm a member of the John Maxwell team. I'm a certified speaker, trainer, and coach. And actually, I had the privilege today at Firestone Country Club in Akron to spend a day with John Maxwell. If you don't know who he is, he has written over 82 books and sold over 27 million copies on the subject of leadership. And he's a good friend and a mentor, and I really enjoyed his program today. I'm also a DISC profile trainer, and that's a behavioral studies model of what's right about us. If you've ever studied any bit of psychology, there's a big book called the DSM-4, and it's at least two telephone books thick, for those of us who remember what a telephone book looks like. And it's everything that's wrong with you, but this is a study of what's right about you, and I've created a course in dentistry about how to pick up the tips, tricks, and cues to be able to sell treatment. Because what I've learned after 10 years chairside is that unless you can influence people to seeing why they need your services. You never get to do any dentistry. And so it's really important. They don't spend near enough time in dental school teaching us these things. And I really appreciate and enjoy giving that course. And then my story, as Lisa laid out for you, is that I've been in dentistry a long time. And I've almost been bred for this in that Though I'm the fourth of six children, I'm the only dentist in my family, and my father had the foresight to put me to work in a dental lab, and through college I made extra money as a dental assistant and got chairside experience, and now, of course, I'm the dentist. So it's just a different background, gives me a few different hats that I get to wear, and allows me to be able to see uh, things from a different vantage point, which I share with you. This is my team, the Catapult Speakers Bureau, which I absolutely adore these people because what our dedication to is quality education. I'm not here to sell you anything tonight. That's not my job. My job is just to bring you any pearl, any bit of wisdom, anything that I've learned, mostly through my own mistakes because I think I've made just about every one you can make in dentistry. And what we are dedicated to is sharing that information with each other so that we can bring quality education to all of you. And I'm a proud member of this group. Let me give you some facts about what's going on in, in dentistry right now. And we practice in different times. In case you didn't realize or you, know, you haven't given it much thought, Things are different in dentistry. There's a lot of things we could flush out, but in the short time that we get to share together, I can't get into everything, but I can say it's different. It's not worse. It's not better. It's just different. And stickability is something we have to consider as business owners. I like to put my business hat on and, and think about things. And if you look at a Fortune 500 list from 1956, can you guess how many are still on that list in 2016? Well, for those of you who have maybe never thought about it, or maybe those of you who are in the know, the answer is less than 8% are on that list. And how come they're still on that list some 60 years later? And the answer is, is because they grew to meet their customers' changing needs. We need to pay attention to what's happening. We have to listen to our customers. And with that business hat on, we also have to think for every 10% that we lose in our fees, we have to work three times as hard to make up for that lost revenue. And this is metrics that isn't me speaking, but those that I picked up from those who are in the know in the industry, who look at these things. And uh, if you're a member of the ADA and you get JADA, uh, the ADA has employed a PhD uh, economist by the name of Marko Vujicic. He writes some very nice articles every month about trending and looking at numbers and things. And a lot of this is plucked from his research, but it's safe to say we have to be efficient in what we're doing in our techniques. So what do you do with all this? Well, I think success in dentistry, it's never been more important that you do the basics well. 
And as Tony Robbins says, success is not an accident. And the beauty about success for everyone listening in on this or those who may log in at a later time for a recorded uh, webinar viewing, um, success leaves tracks. Success leaves tracks. It's one of those things that you can follow along. If it's truly something that's success and not just luck, it's repeatable. And that's the beautiful thing is that we can copy, we can follow on those tracks, and we too will have success. So what are we really trying to do in restorative dentistry when we're thinking about what is the goal? What are we trying to do? Well, first, we're trying to take and have immediate results, but we're also trying to get that long-term piece to the puzzle. So it's twofold, right? We, somebody comes in, a filling is failing, or it's an initial. We're not only trying to fix it then and there, but we're also trying to give them long-term success. We want that patient to leave our chair symptom-free, not calling and complaining that the bite is off or the tooth is hot or cold-sensitive or pressure-sensitive. We're looking at maximizing natural tooth structure. The pendulum has swung where now we know the more natural tooth structure that we can preserve the better the long-term prognosis is for our restorations. We know that we're looking and we've been trying to strive for in the industry for achieving the best dentin substitute out there. We're close. I don't know if we have something that's a silver bullet, but we have a lot of great products out there today. A lot of great products that mimic the physical properties of dentin. We're also looking for the best enamel substitute out there. So we're looking for something that's going to have great wear resistance and it's going to be strong and robust and it's also going to look good because of course we're now in that era where people actually care what things look like and I think so do we as, as dentists. Essentially what we're trying to do and what I'm saying to you is that we're looking to rebuild a tooth from the inside out. We're, we're going through this thought process for most of us once you've been doing it for a while. It's relatively quick, but we're always looking for the best products and the best paths to achieve these long-lasting results. And today, I think the answer is in composite. Most of us are, are doing a lot of composite dentistry, and there's a lot of things we have to consider when we're doing composite restorations. But I can see as a, from a patient's point of view why you would want composites. It's what I would want, too. If you have the choice between having something that is metal or is gray in appearance and could potentially long-term stain or isn't as cosmetic a look or something that actually looks like a tooth and can function and last, um, as long, if, if all things are equal, you would clearly choose the one that looks like a tooth. And that's what patients are going for in most cases and what we are trying to give them as clinicians. So composites, all right? We don't have time to dive into all the nitty gritty of it, but safe to say they're a resin matrix and they have filler particles that have a big influence on how these products handle. And no two are created equal. They may have similar amounts or, or content, but they, the manufacturers are going to vary them to between glass and quartz and silica, and some have pre-polymerized resin, and some are even adding um, pre-polymerized or uh, glass ionomers. There's all sorts of things that are going on. And some of these products are, are promising certain things. Certainly to reduce shrinkage is a big one. But these filler particles, what makes up the internal makeup, has major influence on the materials. It influences the shape, the surface quality, the polishability, the optical index. And when we go to eventually polish, these particles will play uh, either our friend or they'll be our enemy in the process. So as you can see on the images on the left, smaller particles, they have a certain refractive index, and will we bring that restoration to a, a fine shine and finish, um, you're going to get a nice 
glossy look and things are going to look very nice, feel very smooth to the tongue. Whereas some of those composites that have a mixed bag of particle size and filler content um, may not necessarily perform the same in a long-term scenario. It's not saying they're not good and that they don't work, but in terms of the filter of what we're talking about tonight, about shaping, refining, and making it shine, and of course, in the back of your mind, always you want things to last a long time, fillers are going to be something that you have to consider when you're purchasing or considering, what am I looking for out of my composite? So here, let's look historically where we've been. In the past, filler particles and sizes, they were large, they weren't silenated, they tended to pluck out and cause ditching, they had higher wear uh, rates on them. The curing rates and the incremental layering was, was limited to a two millimeter or less, and that made the process more extensive and if you even take into effect how far we've come with curing lights, the original curing lights, the halogens, 40 second incremental cures per two millimeters. And we've made major leaps in that with the revolution of LED and fast curing lights where we can reliably cure in some cases. I've seen three, five, 10, 20 second cures for anywhere from two millimeters up to five millimeters of thickness. So. Uh, that's where we used to be. Volumetric shrinkage in the industry was accepted at 7%, which is a lot, but that was as good as it was back in the day. We had very few shades that were available, and I would say the composites of the past did not have the vitality that they do today, and the flowable category was less filled, they were radiolucent in most cases, which created problems if they were ever put in the bottom of a proximal box. They had a very high shrink rate, and they were very prone to wear. Today, we have a very different scenario. You have composites that have nanoparticles. They're silenated and pre-polymerized and they have all these different matrix in them. They're very fancy in the filler particle um, construct. Today we're in the, in the uh, age of the bulk fill. I mean we have composites and bulk fill materials that make claims in five millimeter increments. The shrinkage rate is very low. I think it's industry standard is accepted two millimeters or sorry, 2% volumetric shrinkage or less. The shading has gotten extensive. You can buy kits now that have some 30 odd shades. You have Denton colors, you have body colors, you have enamel colors that even have names like frost and wind and pearl and opal. It's, it's amazing what you can do if you desire to have that kind of system. You can have numerous choices and you can get very fancy in your layering technique and get really lifelike results. And the flowable composites today have become universal. I almost think that the, ter the term flowable is almost misused. I almost think the term that we could label on a lot of these materials today would be better injectable composites because they're injectable, they're in a syringe, and you can inject them into tight spaces, and they do a great job of adapting and leveling, and they're universal. You can, you can use them in occlusal, load-bearing situations, and truly, for me, I consider this new age injectable slash flowable composites as we know it to be the duct tape of dentistry. I mean, if you've ever had duct tape, um, you can do quick fixes on anything and, and patch things with duct tape, and that's what's great about these modern flowables today is they're universal and in their use, and that really is a great feature and benefit in dentistry today. So quiz question for tonight right out of the bag is who is this man? Who is this man? Well, this is a fellow University of Michigan dental school grad, 
Uh, he's a ghost that floats in the halls of my alma mater. This is G.V. Black. And G.V. Black did a lot for dentistry. And we remember him fondly and, and what he's done in that he created this classification system that we're all familiar with. We have class one occlusals, class two involving posterior interproximals, and so on and so on. And he made the first nomenclature system for how we would identify, classify, code nowadays for doing our dentistry in terms of restorative dentistry. Um, but today's dentistry is different. He would be quite surprised. I hope he would be pleased to see how things have changed and that we don't find his phrase extension for prevention to be true. GV held that if you wanted to prevent decay, you would enlarge the size of your preparation um, to prevent the decay from coming back. And we, of course, know that is not true. That does not hold up. That is not evidence-based dentistry. We also know that his extension for prevention theory of self-cleansing is not supported. This is not something that we, we follow and we go along with. And we do not, without any reason, destroy central contact. So we don't go in there and have to rebuild that. If we can leave that piece of tooth structure behind, it's good for us because it's going to hold vertical and it's going to make finishing and adjusting the occlusion a lot simpler for us. It's going to save time. It's going to save time. That's what it's about. So if you look at an x-ray here and you see an incipient lesion and uh, maybe you use one of the various caries detection systems that are available um, or you're just using standard bite wings and you decide this is what you're going to go in and you need to take care of this because it's reached the dentin. Uh, you would make a preparation similar to this. You would very carefully remove only where you have decay. You let the decay determine the preparation size. But the old form of healthy dovetail, the extension for prevention, as G.V. Black would have recommended, we wouldn't do that today. That is something that we would steer clear of. We would avoid because it's not needed. It's not necessary. It's no benefit to the tooth long term. And here are some images of some smaller slot preparations, things we can do today to be more conservative because we know the more dentin we leave behind, the better the tooth in the life cycle of the tooth and preserving this. The more enamel that we can leave behind, the better and more predictable the bond is going to be. So today's preparations are completely different. It's, it's nice in the sense that you just prep what you need to to get access, to get the decay out, and then we can start considering how are we going to go about restoring this. Again, here are some additional looks of what we would be going at. And sometimes even when we open up a, a small preparation, as is in the upper left tile, you can see that sometimes we see on the mesial or our distal of the tooth, um, whatever direction we're going, you may be able to do a little conservative um, direct just fixing that surface of the tooth like it is on the molar there without having to destroy the integrity of the marginal ridge. We know that that's going to be better for that tooth in the life cycle moving forward. So when you look at longevity compared to, because these are always hot debates that I really don't love to get into because if somebody wants to place an amalgam and they deem it necessary, who am I to tell them that that's not a good thing to do? But the question always does come up, are composites better? So you look at studies where they've looked in meta-analysis of over 5,000 restorations and 59 different studies. And when you see the overall success rate at 10 years is 90%, we know the composite is performing and that we can feel good about using it universally. That means whether posterior or anterior, and the main reasons that we're seeing a composite fail are fracture, so the tooth is it's a large restoration and the tooth fails on us, or we're getting decay, caries adjacent to the rest 
restoration. So somewhere uh, we're getting leakage, and it's hard to say. I mean, it's multifactorial. Let's be honest. Decay isn't a straight shot. It's not because the patient isn't brushing or flossing their teeth. It, it's it's also could be that their diet is heavily laden. Um, we know the Western diet is very high in carbohydrates, which break down to sugars in the mouth. It could be um, dry mouth from medication. There's a lot of factors that go into things. We know on the whole that at 10 years out, over 5,000 restorations looked at, 90% are performing very well. And what's interesting out of some of these studies is the biggest influence on longevity is, surprise, surprise, whether or not you change dentists. I find this fascinating because what it says to me is that every dentist thinks he's better than the next guy or girl um, that, that, was, that was there before. And a lot of times we look at things and say, I, I could do better than that or whatever. And I've learned over time to not judge what I'm seeing because I don't know the conditions or really what's happening. And I've also learned to be a bit realistic in that patients lie. They do lie. They're not always honest about uh, when they were last to a dentist or what the situation is. So remember your colleagues and, and think fondly of them even if you've never met them because uh, that's what's great about this profession is when we band together and we give each other the benefit of the doubt. But uh, when they looked at it, den people and patients that have changed dentists had a 40% replacement rate after seven years. So the biggest influence on whether a composite is changed is whether or not you've changed dentists recently. If you didn't change, uh, we tend to give our work the benefit of the doubt, don't we? Uh, we know the people, we know the patients, the beauty about private practice or staying anywhere for a while is you get to watch your work age. And thank goodness for that because I look at some of the stuff that I did five, seven years ago when I thought I was doing really well and I look at it now and I go, man, I'm getting better. I am getting better and thank goodness for it. So you, so you tend to give yourself a, a different standard and we, we look at things and say, oh, we'll watch that. I think it's still fine. So 7% replacement after seven years, so much lower than if you change dentist. And when it comes to replacement in the five to seven year range out of these studies, the main reason that they were replaced was because of decay. And if they were above 10 years or around 10 years and they needed to be replaced, it was usually a fracture related. So something broke, chipped, it wasn't a decay issue. So those are interesting things to ponder when it comes to how long does this stuff actually last. So let's look at the landscape. We know that a high focus has been on aesthetic dentistry. And people are looking at whether they should do direct versus indirect. And there has been a trend in layering techniques for both anterior and posterior. We also know that there's an increased focus on business productivity. If you have been around and been in dentistry before 2007, 2008, the reason that the business productivity is because in our sector of the economy after the mortgage meltdown, patient spending and buying patterns changed and it affected all of us in that we have to consider how to be efficient. And so companies are looking at simplification of techniques and focusing on tangible properties by the dentist. So today's dental landscape, the most common direct composite um, placement process is amalgam replacement. So amalgams are, um, you know, coming into your office and they're failing, and what are you turning to? Would you like tooth color? Do you like another silver? And I think adhesive dentistry in most cases is what we go to because with the amount of tooth structure remaining, bonding is usually the best option. The average posterior composite is lasting according to what I've seen anywhere. I've seen it as low as three and a half years. I've seen it 
averaging around six. And that gives us a failure rate for posterior class ones and twos between one and three percent annually are failing. And again, these are tough things to flesh out because it's multifactorial. Is it uh, the dentist technique? Is it the actual product? Is it the patient? Is it another circumstance that's playing a factor in it? Cavity forms for many amalgam replacements prove too time consuming to fill with vertical increments. So we're looking for ways, hey, if you've got to do oblique layering at two millimeters at a time and you're doing somewhere around nine incremental layers but you're being reimbursed $135 for that filling. If you're looking at it with a business mindset, it's not going to work too good for your bottom line. So the trend is to, we know that amalgams are being replaced, the cavity sizes are larger, how can we do it better, faster, simpler for both us and the patient and have the longevity be ill-affected? So what does the future look like? What are, we, what are we focusing on or what does the trend seem to be in composite dentistry? Well, bulk placement is here and it's here to stay. I enjoy bulk filling. I enjoy the idea that I can place a large quantity of material, but I can get the same quality as if I had layered it with nine increments and oblique layering and all those things that try to reduce stress and shrinkage. We've gone to dentists want simplified shading. They don't want to carry 30 composites. The average dentist doesn't want to have a lot of uh, overhead with this, this stuff. You don't want to carry a large stock of materials and you look at it and you go, I use C4, what, twice a year for that one you know, root filling I have to do on an 85-year-old. There's a rare case that I'm pulling that out. Most of us are using A1, A2, A3. I, I think that's where we would fall. We want those three colors, if we can, to blend in and have that chameleon effect with everything that we're trying to go through. And we would love it um, if the material would polish very quickly and we don't have to spend a lot of time. In fact, I think if I could add one to this that's not there, I would love for the material to place itself. Wouldn't that be great if you could just, you know, prep the tooth, leave it, and I suppose that's what F does might do. Um, but uh, it would be great if it was just an automated thing where you could put the material in. But this is what we're currently looking at in the future of adhesive dentistry. And if you look at these, these are three years old and they're failing. And you have a lot of issues that can contribute to the long-term success. So what might some of those be? Well, let's talk about composites, shall we? And this is Densply Serona's uh, TPH Spectra. And the beauty of this system is that it's going to offer you varied viscosities. So what? when I was in a room, I had the privilege of being in a room with over 300 dentists and we, it was cool. You had these little clickers and they put up a question on the screen and it was live broadcast voting and you got to click in and ask what are you looking for in a composite and it was amazing because you would think we would be looking at fracture toughness or filler particle content or any of those things and the number one thing now, in, in real estate, you see everybody cares about location, right? If you've ever gone and purchased a home or a condo or a vacation home, you hear real estate agents say it's location, location, location. I mean, if you want to be in the best spot, you're going to pay a little more, but you're not going to get as much square footage, and that's the trend. Well, in dentistry, in this room I was in with 300 doctors, the number one thing people were looking for with their composite, believe it or not, was handling. They cared how it worked in your hands. That was something that everyone cared about. And we have all these terms. I mean, it is so crowded of a space. And some of them mean different things to different people. I know um, being a lab technician is my background. The word sculptable there to me 
denote something that is like molten wax. When I would wax crowns, I mean, sculptable to me was something that flowed and whatnot, but I have several friends and colleagues that sculptable means something that is stiffer and it's like you're chiseling. They think of sculptable a different way. So these are some of the terms that you see out in the industry. You see sticky, packable, stiff, and how do we evaluate these things? Do they have an impact? Do they influence the dentistry that we do? Well, sticky materials, the knock on them is that they're going to be difficult to manipulate. They're going to have this phenomenon of pullback, and they're going to be tough for the dentist to be able to adapt to the cavity preparation. And if it's a material has all the characteristics you're looking for, yet is difficult to work with, I think it's going to be hard pressed for people to buy into it because there's this whole idea and this whole equation that E equals Q times A. Effectiveness equals quality times acceptance. So you may have a top quality product but if the acceptance of it is low because it's hard to work with, well, your effectiveness score is going to be nil. It's not going to work. It's not going to sell. It's not going to be in demand by the dentist. And so for some of these materials, we tend to compensate. If you're working with something that tends to be sticky and, or if the room's a little warm that day because the person who owns your building turned the heat on a little high and those overhead lights are cooking and your materials start to behave a little bit differently. You can tell that's happened to me before. Um, we tend to do things to try to make the materials more manipulating or easier to work with, such as alcohol. People have started dipping their instruments in adhesive, and they, there's even lubricant blocks that you can buy, or fancy titanium Teflon coated plastic instruments. So the beauty of the spectra system is this. They give you varied viscosities. So you have dual viscosities, you have a low viscosity, or what would be described as spreadable, creamy, flows very nicely out of the compule. And then you have HV or high viscosity, which would be something that's more packable. It's a stiffer, sculptable, uh, material that is going to stay more, um, it's not as e tacky in movement. They have a simplified shading system where you can limit the quantity that you need to carry in your stock. It has a great chameleon effect that works very well with uh, the surrounding tooth structure, great stain resistance, and it polishes very easily. So what do you like is the question. And that's what's nice is that they give you the ability to say, well, what, what do you prefer? Are you somebody like me who's a, I like a creamier composite because it reminds me of wax in a crown. Or are you somebody who likes something that's more packable? So here's a scenario where, again, what we're seeing, tooth number, I believe this one is 31, but it's flipped in the mirror. And need to be replaced. The food, it's hard to see with this image, but food was getting caught because the marginal ridge was chipped out. There's no doubt that we have to take 30 and do something with that as well, but we're just treating what the patient wanted, what they needed at the time, and um, this is using TPH Spectra LV, and underneath it I said I bulk fill. I am a, a huge lover in love with Surefill SDR Flow Plus, and I use that because bulk filling just works and it simplifies things. You can see this is single shade, and it blends in. You can't see, of course, a trained eye. You're going to see some of my margins, but this is just after I did a little bit of reduction of the occlusion, get a nice tight contact, a little finishing and polishing, and it works. Now this is a scenario, a gentleman came to me and this tooth had incisal edge decay, it brought, broke it out, and I wanted to try using a single shade, because in the anterior, I'm the type that will take the time, I'll do a dentin shade and an enamel shade, but I know most dentists, what do they want? They want a single shade to give a chameleon effect, 
And so what I did is single shading for this particular tooth I was going to change out. This is 24, and you can see here, single shade. I didn't use any opaque color or anything like that to block out or whatnot, and that's the result. And that's immediate post-op, and I know after the teeth rehydrated, it actually gets better in appearance, and that's, that's one of the nice features about it. But just immediately, it already blends in there quite nicely, and there's a lot of colors in these teeth, so it's nice to have a material that will give you that chameleon-like effect. So simplified shading of the spectra system. Um, it minimizes the number of shades we have to have on stock, and it will give you the complete entire Vita shade guide system of 16 shades with just seven. So uh, it's really nice in that it, in most dentists are going to use A1, A2, A3. And I, I really think seven's available, but you can really just get a few shades and you're going to have almost everything that you need to be able to handle 90% of the dentistry that you do with composites day in and day out. And they have this nice little chart that shows you sort of the range. So if you pick an A1, it's going to work well with a B1, A1, and a B2. But if you pick an A2, it's got a bigger uh, range that it's going to look acceptable for because this system is based off of light theory and delta E and value shading is what's most important in dentistry, otherwise known as lightness and darkness. And so if you get the value right, you don't have to actually have the color exactly on for the patient to not notice a difference. And so this is a really nice example of showing you TPH spectra where they have drilled out on these shade tabs, a small circle, and it's, it's easiest to see on the C2 line at shade tab D2. You can see a little disc or circle. What they've done is they've then placed the material and light cured it and shown you how through all these shades, C2, you can see it's standing out in certain shade tabs more than others but you can see how well a chameleon affects with all of those, and that's just a single shade. And same thing with A35, it's showing you how well it blends in. And so they've made this little preparation, taken out some of the shade tab and applied TPH spectra, cured it, and let you see what we're talking about in this idea and concept of, of value shading and simplifying your life. So, clinical tip that you need to know when it comes to these things, you want to get the shade at the prior or beginning of the restoration because teeth will shade shift six shades possibly and it'll last for 60 minutes. And it takes about five to 10 minutes of, for teeth to dehydrate and then you're going to have an issue there. But there's limitations, right? If you look at the screen, how many white dots are there? The answer, they're all white. but there's issues with uh, binocular vision and transfer of information to the brain. And we know if you stare at the X on this, this is a great example of saturation, where if you stare at that X, wherever you're at now, get near your computer, take a quick look, hold your gaze at the X. We'll count to three, one, two, three, boom. And you can see just for a minute, it vibrates in color as your cones and your eyes are recharging, the receptors that are responsible for seeing color. And what happens is when you're staring at these shade taps for too long, I mean, they all start to look the same. And so what you need to do is this Vita shade guy is arranged according to hue. You can see there's A group, B group, C group, and they describe them as reddish brown, reddish yellow, gray shades. What you want to do is you want to rearrange it according to value, which you can find easily on Google, and it will give you lightest to darkest colors where you will rearrange the guide B1 all the way to C4 and you can see as you move your eye from left to right the shade tabs go from lighter colors to darker all the way on the right side which C4 is the darkest of the Vita shade guides. So when we're looking at doing restorations here um, using the class 2 solution from Dense Ply Serona Restorative you can see you have a selective etch technique being utilized, the Paladin Plus matrix system, little prime and bond elect, sure full SDR, TPH spectra, 
and you get a bulk fill with the Surefill SDR as well as the adaptation. And then you get a nice, with H3, packable and sculptable feel, which is what some clinicians prefer. They like the idea of being able to push the material, and then it's going to give a little push back at them. It's for those who are searching for the amalgam-like feel, those who like that stiffer, the dense feeling. Um, I've worked with the material. It, it, it's a great material, but it's, it's not my preference. My preference is more towards the creamy and sculpt. I, I use that word sculptable because to me that's what it is, even though it's used to describe uh, more of a, a dense fill, but maybe that's just the way my brain works. But I like the creamier consistency of the LV, which is what I tend to use. So, And the reason I do is for this. I use the materials to manipulate and minimize adjustments. Um, this is a great example of how I build anatomy. I don't carve anatomy in with a burr. That just creates scratches. If you really want to make teeth look like teeth, it's how you place the material. And I'm demonstrating here, it's the best image I had, of placing a segment. This is TPH Spectra LV, which is my preferred um, capping composite. And, you know, in this system, I, I like it better than the H3 because I can actually work the material and I can create the anatomy. And as you can see, this was a kissing class too that I did. And uh, the way I recreate central grooves in anatomy isn't doing it with a burr and not getting out things. It's by the placement of the material. And that's why my preference in the TPH spectra line is the LV because I can get something that is going to be easily manipulated and what is my favorite instrument for placing composites? It's a micro brush. Um, I find those things to be super useful and I wish I was the man or the woman that invented them because boy they have to be rich. So what else can I do to improve my handling? Out of the box stuff, what can I do that could potentially, if I'm not going to just think about choosing, varying my viscosity or my handling preference, what can I also do? Well, there's some really neat things that are out there. And as I told you, I product tests. And this is one that's new to me, dropped in my lap, and it's a composite warmer. And they, it's, it's really a slick, neat little system. The benefits of warming composites are, are several things. Here you can increase the depth of cure because the composite's easier to extrude and it adapts better to the walls. And it improves the flow by almost 70%. And because it's warmed, it also shortens the curing time by over 50%. And this has been studied. It's really neat. That's a good feature if you're moving. You want to have the material move quicker, adapt a little better. Um, even taking these great materials, like in the spectra line, and you, you can alter the flow um, by warming them. It does not hurt any of the physical properties. It's been shown to reduce microleakage, give you better physical properties. And you can even heat the instruments if you like to use composite instruments to get better marginal adaptation. And what's neat about the CalSet is that it's got three settings. You can go, um, it's kind of the Goldilocks principle, right? You don't have to heat it just one temperature. You can kind of just slightly heat it. You can medium heat it, or you can turn it up and have it really extrude very nicely. And you can get more information about these things. But it's a little bit out of the box kind of thought of how can you also make your composites easier to work with even if you love what you've got already, um, you can consider warming them. And I think efficiency becomes important too. We can't talk about placing composites without talking about how can you efficiently do it. And one of the systems I really like working with too is the dry shield. Um, it's a real time saver. These are our uh, tongue, cheek, retractor, bite, block, and suction all built into one. And when you're doing composite dentistry, saliva, blood, they don't mix, and especially if you're working on lower molars, it's really a nice thing to have a bite block. The patient can rest on the tooth pillow. The suction is there. Everything's clearing away, and you can just do the dentistry 
if you're not going to use the gold standard for doing great adhesive dentistry of a rubber dam, because a rubber dam is, is a really great thing, these are a really great, efficient time saver, really help you a lot. Something that's worth a look, the dry shield. Now let me talk about how I adjust, because I try my best to place the material to minimize it, but I have a very simplified protocol. My mind just works in, I want to have you know one composite, I want to have one bonding agent, I want to have one PVS, I want to have one burr for my crown preps. This is how I practice, this is how I teach people. For me, I have the Midwest ones, I use single-use burrs exclusively. I just think that in my time at the chair and in my lifetime as a dental assistant, I love dental assistants. But I know this, they don't clean burrs effectively. They just don't. And they're good people, and they're worth their weight in gold. But of all the jobs that they have to do, this is a low priority for them. So it's just better to spend a few cents more by single-use burrs. And I use the Midwest Once Super Fine Grit Football to do adjusting. And it's also a really great burr for adjusting zirconia crowns because you don't want to use anything coarse because you'll never be able to polish the, the scratch marks out. And you can't use carbides on zirconia because it will leave uh, gray marks from the burr. It'll actually put metal scratches on it. But I do love using Brassler's single-use carbides because carbides with their fine flutes are going to create a glass-like finish. And when you're doing finishing of any kind of anterior composite or posterior, it's a great way if you have any flash or anything, you're going to get glass mirror-like finishing. And I love to use AccuFilm 2 and it's a very, very thin material. And have you ever had those scenarios where patients are coming back in and complaining about, oh, I, I had this done, I think the bite's just off, and you mark it and you don't see anything, and maybe it's just me, but you, you think maybe I'll do a, one of those, I'll just run the burr over the tooth and they'll think I adjusted it, that phantom adjustment, um, because you just don't see anything, nothing's marking. Well, I've learned this trick a long time ago, and that is, rub Vaseline on your articulating paper and what you will see is marks you never saw before because in order for articulating paper to work you usually have to have very dry surface and what is exactly what happens every time you dry the teeth off the patient immediately licks the area you just dried with their tongue and you think to yourself why are you doing that and yet that's what they do so if you want to activate the colorant and make it stick to the surface and find marks that you didn't know were there, Vaseline is the best way to do it, and it works wonderfully well. And then I will come over, and I am very simple in my polishing technique, and that is I will finish with an enhanced finishing cup. They create a nice, smooth surface, takes the particles down, creates a nice, smooth to the tongue, a matte finish, and if in, I'm working on an anterior tooth, I'll use the POGO system, which is diamond impregnated. Um, you need to have the right technique, very, very light pressure to get the POGO to work for you. The Enhance is meant to disintegrate, and it comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. 95% of my finishing is done with these, and only when I'm working on anterior teeth or class fives where you need to have that wet gloss while I use a pogo. But for the majority, I use these, and they're great because they decrease heat as you're polishing so you don't um, heat the tooth or anything like that. Very simple. So just a real quick case where I did a buildup. This gentleman, the tooth broke, and we deemed that it needed endo. I would do this case differently today. I would have done a build-up first before I ever did endo-axis, but I'm getting smarter. I uh, did it this way, where I did the endo first, and then I thought, oh, I better do a composite that they can leave with. But nowadays, I would have done a composite and then endo-axis through my composite. It's just a cleaner, easier way to do it. But I ended up filling this. This is Guttacore, great product from Densply Tulsa, and bonded. And this is Surefill SCR Flow Plus, and it's a great bulk fill, and 
It's uh, great for sealing the orifices, great use in application, more than just uh, for basing. You can use it in endodontic situations as well. And then finish it off with some TPH spectra, and the patient walks out with that. That's single visit endo resto, great profitability in that uh, visit. And you can see this is the before and the after, okay? And two years later, the patient has not been back to get the crown on it, because that is just a buildup, and I would agree, you probably want to do a crown on it. But we got sidetracked because we ended up pulling the tooth behind it, which she split right down the middle, and we've done a dental implant. And yet, you can see this restoration is still holding up strong with just uh, components of this system, this class two solution. So here's my summary for tonight. What is the greatest composite on earth? Can you guess? It's the one that works in your hands. That's the answer. The one that works in your hands is the greatest one. It's your ability to manipulate the material is what's going to make the big, big difference on whether or not this turns out and works well for you. So it's all part, some of these things are part of what Dense Plicerona's uh, restorative class two solution, and we've touched on a few of these, these points, but it's a really nice system to give you predictability long term. I'll leave you with this thought, the two reasons that we seek change as human beings on this earth, as far as I know. The first is out of desperation. People will usually seek change because they're desperate. It's a response. Something bad happens, tragedy comes about, and they're looking as a response. But the second reason people change is inspiration. Inspiration. And usually this is because we're seeking answers or solutions. Somebody has given us guidance, a pearl, and the reality of it is this. We are bound to repeat our past failures, must prompt us, prompt us to amend our current conduct. Past failures must prompt us to amend our current conduct. Or the present and future will duplicate the past. So this is my information. Should you choose to need to reach me beyond today, I can be found at Dr. Tim Bisga on Facebook. I have a Facebook page. I'm very responsive to answering questions. Toothlectures.com is my website where I put all my notes for all my courses as well as some other great papers and information I encourage you to check out and read. And should you want to email me personally, you can find me at toothlectures at gmail.com. At this point, um, I will take any questions. So a great question has come through. How many flutes does your finishing carbide have? I buy the single-use carbides, Joseph, and they're from Brassler, and I believe they're 10 to 12 flutes. The more flutes you have, the better the overall finish is what you're going to have. Another great question has come in. Do you recommend using curing the flowable composite before placing the packable composite? It's a great question. And I know that often it was taught that you would have this version of what's called the modified snow plow. There's a, I've seen articles written on it. I know I was taught it in school, which is uh, in order to get really good adaptation in the proximal box, because it's very irregular or there could be undercuts there, um, you would place flowable, you'd place packable, you'd smush them together, and you'd cure the two together. Um, if I'm placing a bulk fill flowable, such as Surefill SDR, its adaptation is second to none. I mean, it's amazing to see the histo histology slides when you see how intimately it, it comes in contact with the dentin. Uh, I, I always cure. The light has to get to the bottom of the proximal box. The average depth, distance 
from your curing light to the bottom of the proximal box is 6 millimeters. And so we know from light theory that at that distance, only about 35% of the light from the curing light's energy is actually making it to the bottom of the proximal box. So what we need to do is we need to ensure that we not only cure that initial layer, but we need to make sure that we cure a little bit longer or we know what our light output is so that we can get um, a great result because the number one place that we're seeing posterior composites fail. They're not failing on the occlusal. They're failing in the proximal box region. When you couple potentially under curing and then you put the patient who may not floss regularly, this is where we're seeing problems. So Jose, great question. And the answer is I would cure that material and make sure I know the physical properties of that material are what I'm looking for to get the result in that area. Okay, I have another great um, question here. Which cavity liner or base do I like best? So the answer for me is, is if I'm looking to do some liner or base, my favorite product out there right now is Biscos Theracal. There's really good stuff uh, out about it, and it's one of those quote-unquote biodynamic liners. And what I like about it is that you know it replaces traditional calcium hydroxide and glass ionomer. Those two steps, which are both, uh, in most cases, they're usually auto cure. There's no light cure component. Of course, glass ionomer, if you use a light cure kind, you can save time, but the calcium hydroxide, you still have to wait. And Theracal is like a two-in-one type replacement where you get the benefits of both worlds, and then you can etch and bond over the top. So that right now for me is a great base liner. I'm also exploring the world of um, some other biodynamic materials like Activa and checking them out, but there, I need to see a little bit more about what's being studied about them before I could say, yeah, switch over. But I, I like Theracal. I use that when I need uh, a base or liner, an indirect pulp cap or something to the like underneath composite restorations. You use SureFill SDR flow for bulk fill and then just cover the exterior surfaces with TPH spectra? And the answer is yes. Surefill SDR is a posterior bulk fill flowable like material that is meant to be capped. In order to get it to be bulk fill, to have the adaptation, the self-leveling property that it has, um, all these great features that speed us up in time and save us time but don't sacrifice quality for us, it did have to give up one characteristic and that would be wear characteristic. It does not wear. It's a dentin replacement material. That's the best way to think of it. What is dentin covered with in the mouth? Enamel. And why is enamel covering dentin? Because it has great wear characteristics. And so TPH spectra, whether you use LV or HE over the top, is, is going to give you the better wear characteristics over that material, and then you're going to have less incremental layering. So you can take a big old MOD and you can fill both mesial and distal box and across the pulpal floor, fill it up, cure in different areas. You might hit it 20 on the mesial and 20 on the distal so that you get those proximal boxes good and cured and then you put a nice capping layer with some TPH spectra and you've really cut a lot of time out because you're just really adding about a millimeter and a half of material so that you get a nice aesthetic look as well as good wear characteristics. I suppose I'll take this a great question from Gary and thank you for the question. What are your thoughts on the newer bioactive composites. 
So I, I mean, I suppose bioactive you might be considering, as far as I know, unless there's something that's newer that's come out, like the gyomer category or like Activa from Pulp Dent. Um, I like the idea, Gary, of bioactives. I like the concept. I like the theory. I like the idea of, to me, the definition of bioactive is a material that sets up the possibility of tooth self-repair. So that's my working definition of it. And I love the idea of the category. I can't say if it's a silver bullet. I, I like them. I like these new products and I like using them and I, I'm trying to do my own study of them and that I'm placing them in with confidence that they do what they say they, they're going to do and then I watch them age and I then look for papers that are people are studying in labs at universities and things and, and giving me feedback and then you know right now it's very promising. I'm liking what I'm seeing but you know, it's, it, I think the jury's out because I think anybody who can stand up here or, or talk to, or speak into your world will say the same thing. The jury is still out because we don't have long-term data. These products are so new, they look really, really great in the initial like couple year studies, but we really want to see how do they perform long-term. So my answer is promising, but we still have to be guarded about the long-term for now. Right now it's looking good though. Good question from Randy. Do you ever bevel the cable surface margin every day of the week and twice on Sunday, Randy? I'd love to have gotten into, but in 45 minutes, yes. I bevel, bevel, bevel everywhere that I can, whether I'm anterior or posterior. On the cable surface margin, I put a bevel. And the reason is, is you're, you're expanding the amount of available enamel rods that are open that you can bond to. Um, there's good work that's been done by David Clark about how important it is to bevel to get enamel prisms rather than sidewall enamel rods. And yes, I bevel everywhere that I have enamel, including on molar occlusal cable surface margins. It's not a big bevel, but it's enough to open it up and that way I get better long-term better looking and the promise also is, is that you can potentially lower C factor which is that ratio we use to measure stress of materials. And Joe Siff has another good question. Do you put Vaseline on both sides of the AccuFilm or just the side with the restoration? Well Joseph uh, the assistants just slobber it on both sides, and I suppose it'd be really hard to just do one. And honestly, I don't mind if it marks on the other side as well, because sometimes if you follow very basic occlusion rules, buckle, upper, lingual, lower, those are your non-functioning cusps. And if you're hitting on inclines on the buckle and or inclines on the lower lingual cusp, those would be the first areas, they're the non-functional cusps, they're the best areas to go ahead and adjust. And so put the Vaseline on both sides, it doesn't hurt. And Vaseline is very inexpensive and very friendly to work with. Um, so put it on both sides, save yourself the time. Well, that's been a bunch of uh, great questions from the group. And I appreciate everybody taking the time. And Thank you, everyone.